Good morning, Tansi. Kita tamiskat na anuts kaya kisipak. Nasit eminaw si kisikaw emini ko ak. Mantu. Minan na nas ko ma mantu. Kaya si mini ko ak anuts kisikaw. Kita tamiskat na kino kagino. Early childhood educators. Thank you for working with our little children. Kita tamiskat na. My name, Rebecca Ross. I'm from Pimichikama Green Nation. I'm a Muskegu Cree woman. I'm a grandmother with three grandchildren. I have a grand, two granddaughters and a grandson. So it is uh, with honor that I'm here to moderate this panel of distinguished elders. So we have a number of questions. We are I'm going to ask the panel. We had a lot of questions, really good questions, but we can only ask so many. So my first question, but maybe before I go into that, my background, I went to school in Cross Lake, Dauphin, Brandon University, and University of Manitoba. I'm a former teacher, early childhood educator, teacher, classroom teacher, resource teacher, and uh, was a council member with Cross Lake Band, and also education director for 19 years. So that is my background. So with that, I'm deeply honored to moderate this panel, like I said, of distinguished elders. We have questions, and my first question I'm going to ask one of the elders, maybe I'll ask, I'll get Eunice to lead off with the first question. If you can tell us about our traditional ways of the child rearing and about the way things used to be as First Nations people. Tansikagi peu isiu pigiawa swag o te peu tanak Kayas Pituski Kiskeni Tena no no chase you pigiawa shunaniwak. Eko si Yunis. Kayasuma Mitaniki Kiwestan Kaunigi Guma with Wena Kaskina Wena Giwi just that Eko Spi. Magano speak so go hispano. Mistake on give one I go now. May God and Onigi go with Wena. Long time ago, it was very, very easy to be a parent because the whole community took part in raising our children. Today, there's, it's so different because there's so many interruptions, so many things that take us away from our duty as being a parent. The children, I know they feel that. They want that connection, that family connection, the community connection with the grandparents, the parents, the uncles, the aunties, and the leadership. Long time ago, when I was growing up, we always had everybody looking out for us. When we were out to play, our parents never had to worry. We had aunties, uncles, and the rest of the community members that looked after us. They were not afraid to discipline us. Now, today, that fear is there. There's that reluctancy to um, discipline others, other children in the community. And I think that's where the breakdown is because we're not working together with the parent. The parents need that support from everybody in the community. 
so that children see that. Because we all know children <coughs> grow up the way they see things. They imitate. And years ago, when we disciplined our children and gave them guidance, it was with love, patience, and calmness. Today, we don't have that. I noticed a lot of our children aren't able to listen unless you raise your voice. And what does that tell you? You're hearing that from home, the community. And we need to start working together in involving the parents. Because the parents are the ones that guide their children. And we need to give them that guidance as elders. Our elders are very quiet. They're, they don't seem to feel free today to give that guidance. But I think um, if the parents know that they can go to the elders, to the elders to get uh, some guidance, they will be more than happy to get that guidance because we all know elders are very humble. They don't push themselves on people. They just show by example. They live by example. And they create that knowledge in the children. They show that knowledge in our children. And I think um, that's what's lacking, the difference today in being a parent. And we all know that that was taken away from us through residential school. But we're on a healing, and healing journey and we as educators need to start providing some awareness to the parents, inviting them and showing them that we need them because we can't do it alone as teachers. The next uh, person I'm going to ask, the next elder, is Angel Enigueri. I'm going to ask her the same question, and we have a translator. And the question we have is, can you tell us about our traditional ways of child rearing, about the way things used to be as First Nations people? Hello? Yeah, I hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, <laughs> Sit <laughs> Shankuli 
Good morning. I'll do my best in translating. <laughs> um, my mother is, uh, she comes from uh, North Lansban as well as Modest. And she grew up in a old, like a, how she grew up is a lot different than today. She said the, she grew up with the wild, the land, and, but what, how she uh, sees the world today is a lot uh, different. And like seems like young people are lost within their culture. Some of the kids today, they don't speak their language. And she said uh, she uh, helps and like uh, how she grew up is a lot different with the school and where she went and it's it's got a hold of her I guess I don't I'm not sure but she has uh, nine children and uh, one of uh, my brothers had passed away my father was uh, Archie in Aquinary and he also helped with the community for the last 20 years he was in the elders paddle for uh, bigger organizations than but anyways he was helping the young people along try to open doors for resources to come in just for the youth but he passed away on a job he suffered a heart attack in uh, Thompson and then She's saying that she wanted to do in that direction just to help the young people. And it's kind of hard when the, when the community is not together, how are we going to raise children? That's pretty much her. And she's going to tell us more. So I guess that's it. She <laughs> did 
Um, she just uh, she commented on the, the education part of the system. She, when she grew up, there was no uh, like there was only one language that was taught, and um, there is no education or there's no TV. There's nothing <coughs> of uh, communicating with a society. <coughs> Growing up back in those days is very hard for her. And all she wants is today is for the young generation to gain more traditional values and to, to uh, not to lose that culture, not to lose a language. And when she went, uh, when she was a teenager, she was, uh, she said she was very uh, scared to uh, ask for stuff, request for stuff under her, her grandmother. And today it's not like that. Kids want an iPad, okay, I'll go to Walmart. But yeah, today it's a lot uh, like she wants the youth, the best for the youth and keep up with the traditional values and other aspects, but she will uh, talk again when it's her turn. Merci. Hey, Kusani Angel, can I ask you to ask you to ask you to ask you to ask one more elder, the uh, Ojibwe Cree elder, Helen uh, Legario. The same question. Can you tell us about our traditional ways of child rearing, about the way things used to be as First Nations people? Good morning, everybody. I speak the island lake dialect and numnendan uh, pizan pintigian ma ewap magn jaks jaks wet ma teap ega ket mak mayat ega ke kinawa kispen wetun jek was ka magnan te ke ang ktegan wajing so my beginning is when Jack, that I want to maybe flat kitchen cat. My turn to kitchen Jack, I want to and when Jan. Okay, I'm gonna say this in English so everybody can understand me. Um, I wrote some things because I thought about this for a while because um, I got some questions, <laughs> questioners, so I, I sat down and I thought about it. 
And um, his question was, can you tell us about our traditional ways of life, about the way things used to be, and about who we were as First Nations people? So I'll start off by when I was very small, young, I should say. <laughs> I'm pretty old. I know I don't have white hair, but I'm 70 years old. <laughs> so I'm not young. <laughs> OK. This was, before electric this was before electricity in the communities. People went to trap lines, fishing and camping, but some stayed behind on the reserve. Everywhere they were, everyone would contribute to preparing the shelter, both outside and inside the shelter. They would gather firewood for cooking and keeping inside warm. The men and the boys went hunting. Sometimes women and young children set snares for small game. The women also prepared to receive whatever the men brought home, like meat and things like that. In the summertime, there would be fish for the family. The big game, such as moose, would be shared among all the members of the communities. In the summer, everyone would go berry picking. During this period of time, people lived off the land, and it was all part of education. The only difference was there were no desks or pencils. Yes, there were hard times, but people survived because they had their own medicine from the land. They knew which plants to use. They had clothing made from animals. Most of their needs came from animals and plants. As First Nations, they were self-sufficient. That's what um, the First Nations were very self-sufficient a long time ago. And it, I, I think it can happen again. And um, <clears throat> that this was a long time ago. Nowadays, it's different. Things have changed. Uh, I, I, I wrote lots of other stuff. I'm just going to give it to you. Because <laughs> that's not part of the question. <laughs> Thank you all for coming here and thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. We'll go to the one more elder on that question. We'll ask um, maybe Irvin Wilson to answer that question. Can you tell us about our traditional ways of child rearing and about the way they, about the way things used to be as First Nations people? Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, the question is, <clears throat> one of the things that I find out that when we were young, I was sort of the one who went out in the land and brought home small game. I grew up without a father. I only had a, a mother. And my primary job was to bring in game. And a lot of it was small game. Rabbits, chickens, fish, beaver. 
One of the things that we realized is we were connected to the land in our traditional ways. We looked out at creation, we saw our livelihood, our food, our provision was there. And the thing that we had was we had values. We had values that we, that was, I believe, that became a part of our lives. When we ate, we, we all sat at the table. We shared as a family unit. Today, we don't have that. We hear about the, the term engagement. And one of the things I really believe in Transformation will only come through the spirit of collaboration and community engagement. In our early lives, we had community engagement. Community engagement has to become a very foundational framework of our development and education. When I look out here, Today, I see uh, history makers, I see world changers, I see people that's going to contribute to ours, a framework, creating a framework, so that our people will maintain that, that re resiliency. When we are disconnected from the land, we lose our identity. If I was to ask the question, what are the two most important days in your life? If I was to ask that question, we would, we would kind of think. But to me, and to our ways of life is, is the day that we were born and the day we found out why we were born. Because we have, our children, they're asking themselves this question. Why am I here? What's my purpose? What's my destiny in life? And we have drifted away from, I like to call it landmarks, ancient paths. I believe one of the biggest shock waves that just recently hit our country was made by a woman by the name of Jody Wilson. I think she created a, a shock wave that rolled across this country. And one of the values of our people were brought to the forefront. And that value was truth. And that's a landmark, that's an ancient path that we don't divert from when we are building our communities. Because when you think of our people, we have a universal value system that we believe in. It has to do with respect, Honesty, humility,
courage, wisdom, and love. And that's what our parents had with love, compassion, our communities. I don't know if any of you have ever heard the term bees. But I remember when things were needed in families, wood was required, the community would get together and move in in that area of helping that individual get all the wood they needed to last out through the winter. If anybody needed a cup of sugar, we would borrow a cup of sugar. That was our people. That was part of our way of life. I believe that as we walk into healing and reconciliation, a time of bringing back of who we really are, We will grow, we will take our place. I still remember when we first looked at our education in our community. We, did, we looked around and we asked, we wanted to employ our own teachers. We had, we had none. But today, when I look out into the audience here, I see a wealth of knowledge. I see educators that's going to help shape the future of our children. And our children are all gifted through your knowledge and through your learnings. Those giftings could be brought to life so that they in turn could get up and be the young man, the young woman that they are purposed to be. Our people are resilient people. We will not die out. We will continue to go forward. And as we latch onto these landmarks, our values, it'll keep us together. It'll keep us at the boardroom tables of planning. It'll keep us, it'll give us the ability to work together as Native people and collaborate. And walk into our future. Thank you. Thank you, Urban. Okay, uh, we're going to go to the next question. I'm going to skip some uh, few questions, and I'm going to ask uh, Ruth Norton the question of uh, what role can elders and knowledge keepers play in teaching language and culture? Back to me, Eyak <laughs> Show any 
Take it, Pishai Kuma. She go Nina named the man. The governor won't eat chicken, dunk chin a snabe mut. Chimashki go mut. Chicken dunk guy. Well, a goity win. A pitcher, me ye chicken the mot. Me ye anish. Kagito the mot, me wish a chin a snabek. Monia shakmagi be shawak. Ugi quetch mon in a Kagita bend the mot oi ke. Chin a snabek. Me satashe. Guys, it was treaties. Me nina named the man, Iktad Sianchiga. They go up in a one chick and dung, or one in there. To go, yea, I give a sec. Gagi piece a sec, I go make a eh. They go chick and the mot, key not. Che canona ek. Kina o mao aniga bi se sek. Ape che mi yen in de nendam. Chicken the mot, kibinonji and suck habinonji ek. Poshke ke. Shkayan suck kakwe. Anamiawat. Kakwe. Nishnabe mot. Me, get Chay out. Shall we name Kinao, Mom? And I don't think I'm uh, really answering her question, but I came here for a purpose, and that's because as a former educator, and I've been in education for over 50 years, I believe that the language is very important. And I believe that it goes with our treaties. Every single child across the country, and especially in our areas. Treaty one, those kids should know what treaty one is and what exactly happened in treaty one. But the Benda no Oksha They have to know when they're one, two years old, five years old. I own this country. There is no way that they should not know what the treaties were. I were. I may sound very political, but I worked with Assembly of First Nations for a long time, and I worked with chiefs across the country. And I worked in the area of what our rights were. And we always they always talked about the treaties because the elders were behind them there's an old man from onion lake saskatchewan he couldn't speak english and he told us in 1993 you have to teach the kids the treaties, what came up, what was in the treaties, who sat there, how long did they negotiate, what did they negotiate. Those kids have to know that. The, the rights, their rights, the water rights, and also with that, to me, the history has to be t taught to the kids. When I was a principal at the high school, I taught those kids that our history. One of them came up with the, our card from 1932 when we were still under the siege of in reserve. We always had to be in our reserve. We couldn't go out of our reserve until the agent gave us a card. Now here, the agent would say, you have the permission to go out of your reserve. You imagine that? And then in 1960, I told the students, that's when the reserves opened up. 
Those kids have to know that history. Why it was that our people who were fishermen and they even had to have a card to go out hunting, everything was right there that they owned. They, they had to ask the agent. And so that history has to come out of our schools. No one else has that responsibility but you. You are the teachers. You're teaching the kids, and they have the right. If there's ever a right for our Indian kids, our Nishnabe kids, our Cree kids, and they have the right to, to learn what the treaties are all about. And they have to learn the history. Because when they go into the university, Universities have their own way of telling history. Half of the time I don't believe them because I know from my parents, my grandparents, what came about. And I'm old enough now to say that I experienced that when we were locked in our reserves. We were under siege and that was after the treaties. Those children have to know that right from the time that they enter. Kindergarten, grade one. I have um, a little granddaughter, great granddaughter. The creator gave me a replace, I wouldn't say replacement, but someone who was like my son, Derek. And her name is Gemma. Gemma Fontaine. She, she knows what I'm talking about. She's five years old and she, she's able to talk to me. But I'm teaching her what her rights are, where she's from. So to me, as an old time educator, those are the two things that are most important for our children to learn. The treaties and the history and the language, three. So to me, until my dying breath, I'm going to be telling the teachers, tell the kids your, the treaties, their treaty right, and tell them our history. Those are the three things that they need to know. Kinaiwa. Amen. Thank you, Ruth. We're going to uh, Modest uh, next to maybe uh, answer that question. Uh, what role can elders and knowledge keepers play in the teaching language and culture? Masi, Janet, is an idea, see, Sequi Randa Yel Tila, don't Jacu Adon El Tranorillo, Sequon El Tranedidaucio. At the Sequizi duly, is it a noni da Asna de C, Casin, who trassi? Did it at the Sequi Honilton? At the Bejano Beatu. Okay, um, my name is Modest and Sanan, and uh, <coughs> when they did the background, they only say my name and where I came from, because I didn't really know I was supposed to put all that background in there, what you have done. So I'm just going to say a little bit of that. I worked in school for 20 years as a teacher assistant. I went to Brandon University <clears throat> and University of Manitoba. I have 90 credit hours. I never, I never finished. I did 90 credit hours through 
tour my education. But in 20 years, I, I taught like Taekwondo, which right now we have over 30 black belts. I work with junior rangers. And I was a ranger, which is affiliated with the armed forces. And uh, junior rangers are more like uh, cadets that they have in the city. And also in school, like I worked 20 years and I work in industrial arts. I was also working in the gym. I was all over the place. And I, my main thing was, uh, was outdoor education, but now they call it land-based education. So I did that for 20 years, because before that, I used to work in uh, framing on carpentry for six years. So I work in industrial arts also, working with the... So I've been all over the place with the, the school. And before that, I was like uh, in commercial fishing and also trapping for about 13 years before I got involved into the school. So with all that experience, I always focus on uh, what was important to me was culture. And our culture is our language and our tradition and to live off the land. So I always focus on uh, the language is, and also the culture. And I focus on uh, single parents. You know, the children, I take them out hunting, fishing, like through school hours. And also I do that every weekend. And for me, you know, a few elders that talk, the most important is our treaty very important in our language. So to me, as a, was a teacher, what's important for me is language. How can we teach our kids to learn their language again? Because most of us, we speak and in our language, but you know, I notice when we're speaking, sometimes we use English and our language together. And most of the time, we say things like, like nouns. We say it in English. So, for example, you know, one time I went to a classroom. This is before when I was still in school, like working this about 10 years ago. I went into a kindergarten. And I point to a chair and I says, in my language, I says, Didi Laulia. And the kid told me, chair. So I started listening to people who were talking to little ones and were saying nouns, like, you know, like objects. We say it in English, like door dotting T. So door dotting T like, means close the door, but already we say door in English. So for the little ones, they're like sponge, you know, for them, that's their language. You know, the, the, that's a Denny word, you know, door or chair or spoon, you know, spoon causing tea. And I start noticing that, you know, I says, okay, these kids are learning what we're teaching them, what we're saying at home. So when I think about language, because today language is very important to me. And we should start as early as we can. And the easiest thing we can teach is the kids could see and they could listen. And which is syllabics. That's the only way we can do our syllab. Syllabics is sounds. If we learn how to read syllabics, we can read anybody's language. You know, we can even read Chinese language because it's, it's a sound. We can even translate Ojibwe or Cree or Dene, you know, because we can translate it because it's written. So 
if we start teaching, if we really want to survive with our language, is the best way is syllabics. Because it sounds and it's easy to learn once we start teaching them. And the other thing is culture, you know, like uh, the elders are saying, you know, our treaty and our history is very, very important. Because I come from Treaty 10. We have to teach our kids what is Treaty 10, because it's different from Treaty 1. Because we don't have farms, you know, we're hunters and fishermen. Nothing grows up north except tamarack or evergreens, you know. <laughs> Because the time is short and our trees are small. Because uh, a friend of mine used to tease me in Brandon. He says, you come from the little sticks. You know? <laughs> okay, so that's, just wanted to say that. that that's uh, a thing about language and culture. Because our culture is, uh, without our language, we're, we're nobody. In our culture, you know, you have to learn how to fish, hunt, and survive, like shelters. You know, a lot of times I used to say, you know, put me 50 miles away from everywhere and put a professor in there. He says, I'll be back. But I don't know he'll be back. <laughs> so you have to learn both, you know. You have, if you want to survive in... In the city, you know, you have to have your education. But with that, you know, we should have our, our language. Very important to teach our kids, the little ones. And our culture, you know, weekends. I used to take my son out hunting or fishing. We have that time, you know. So if you do that every weekend, you know, there's 52 times in a year. So, okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sonny Modes. I'm going to go to the next question. Uh, where time is going fast, and I'm going to ask Elder Don about this question, and maybe the others also can uh, answer the question too. This year, 2019, is the International Year of Indigenous Languages. How can indigenous languages be taught to the children in early years, early learning? Thank you. You should teach them right away. <laughs> Everything else is just dressing. <laughs> I think they better say something. <laughs> when I uh, when I when I first day of school. Norway House. Uh, I was nine years old. I tell people I was uh, six feet, 200 pounds, nine years old. Then I saw a nine year old. I said, Oh, I guess I was lying all this time. <laughs> but I'll just, I'll just mention a couple of things. One is that uh, when I started school, there was, only, there was only one language that I knew, and that, and that was Cree. The Upuani Stave was Pigian, Mosangini Nimonan. That's what we did. Like, Cree was uh, the language that we used at home, and uh, Cree was a language that, that was used in the community. And, so what I, in that, in that, in the community when I was growing up, I, I knew, I certainly knew everybody in the, in a community that, 
the small community that we were on. It's called Robertson Bay, for those of you that are, I think there's one or two Norway house here. It's called Robertson Bay. If you talk to Robinsons, they'll say, no, it's not Robertson Bay, it's Robinson Bay. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm speaking right now, it's Robertson Bay. <laughs> But and I also knew almost everybody with, within the within, within distance of where we lived. And certainly most of my, most of my relatives at, at Rossville, Rossville is the main, is the main community at Norway House. Uh, I knew where my, I knew where my family came from. Uh, I know who my relatives were in those communities. And, uh, and occasionally we even met them. One of the things that has been mentioned is that there was always communication between the people and between the communities. And even in the old days, uh, sometimes uh, the family had put their uh, family together and they'd go visit uh, Cross Lake, Oxford House, and. and uh, and wherever else you could get by by canoe. And so when, when you talk about what, what should we teach, <clears throat> I think we teach about our family and our, 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 uh, our friends that are our friends and our relatives that live in the, in, in the, in, in the other communities. Because one, one of the things that I, that I find happening, and I'm, and I am, uh, I'm, I'm getting old. Okay. I, uh, no, I was getting, I was looking funny because I dyed my hair. <laughs> you know, what? You know, when you're over, when you're over 80 years old, you, you shouldn't walk around with black hair. <laughs> I can tell you, I think 80 years to tell my story. <laughs> anyway, so I'll say this. But I, I knew what, what, I, what I want to say. I knew what was happening in the community. I understood everybody in the community, and everybody in the community understood each other, right? So my knowledge, my knowledge base was very deep, very strong, and, uh, and very communal, right? Whatever that means. I'm not, I use words I don't know what they mean. <laughs> if I don't say anything, I, I can usually pass it over because people don't want to don't want to sound disrespectful. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not a word. <laughs> anyway, so I knew all this. I had all this background information about my community. All those things that uh, people have talked about. Those are, those are the community. Those are the things that happen in the community. I never, on the time that I was growing up, saw a checklist that said, this is how you should behave. I never saw a thing like that. I don't know if anybody else did. Nobody ever said, uh, well, here are seven rules that you should follow. More than that, <laughs> more rules than that. Okay, that's my introduction, so. <laughs> and all I want to say to you, no, what? <laughs> I'm also a theologian, so. When I start, first day of school, this is where I was going to start, right? I got lost myself. I by the way, I like it. One of the secrets, I'll just reinforce what you said, right? One of the things that we really need to do is involve parents in the education of their children. The first day of school, I was nine years old. I was seven feet tall, 400 pounds. No, I, <laughs> I, well, somebody has to be funny. Right? Everybody is serious as well. Right? Is warming you up. <laughs> but 
the first day I walked in school, like I knew, of course I knew everybody that was there, right? One room school. Uh, for, those of, well, for those of you that know our house, it used to be at, right behind the RCMP uh, ground at our house. It was a one room school. That's where I went. So the first day I walked in, uh, everybody, everybody was in little rows, <laughs> two or three people to a desk. And, and then at the, at the appointed time, the teacher walked in and began to teach. And all the time that she taught, I didn't understand one word she was saying. Because she was talking in English, and all I knew was Cree. That was one thing. The second thing is that all that knowledge that I ta just told you about, it really didn't mean anything. Because what I was learning was a new language with new materials that come from a new country, old country, I guess. So my, my one of my missions uh, lately is to follow in the footsteps of Ruth Norton. I, I want to pay respect to Ruth because all He's not listening to me, but that's okay. I'll still talk about her. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> There's two, two things I always remember about Ruth. One is her, her commitment to the language, really, right? The other one is her commitment to the old, to the old people. When she first started the Manitoba Association of Native Languages, there were 60 people from all the, almost all the reserves in Manitoba that was a part of that development. Right? So, and ever since then, she's, she's kept that up. She's kept that up. And uh, still, the, to her, language is still important. So, what I... What I learned, and what I, want, what I want to say to you, oh, I got lost of time, I got three minutes. Uh, <laughs> what, <laughs> what, I want to, what I want to say is, what I want to tell you is this. All that experience that I had when I first went to school, that was not useful to me because I didn't understand what the teacher was saying because she was speaking in a different language, right? And so, when your children come into the classroom, right, make sure that they know what it is that you're talking about. Because maybe the, the information that they bring is not the information that's in the textbook. Right? Well, I guess that's enough. I Thank you, Don. Now, we, you know why I left them at the end? <laughs> okay, I have, uh, time is uh, coming to the end, but I want to ask this question, and I'm going to ask anyone of the elders to answer. How can the parents, grandparents, homes, schools, and communities nurture the spirit of the developing child? Okay, who wants to answer that? Thank you, Ruth. Well, the way, one of the ways, I know all of you know ways of encouraging the children to, to learn the language and so on. But I think if you have programs Immersion, immersion's the best way, or the bilingual one. At least you, you give them something to go home with. Why I'm really big on immersion is because it, it ha you have the ability to, to have the grandparents come in, because they're the ones that have the language, 
and also the parents themselves. They come into the class and they help the teacher. And you may have people that write in your schools that are very good speakers that'll come into the class as well because it's an immersion program. And to me, that's what I've seen across the country. That's very, uh, it's flourishing and the kids are beginning to really know the language inside out. So everybody, I've, I've, I've always said, every school in the province of Manitoba, our schools that is, should have immersion. Immersion, immersion of Cree and all the other Ojibwe and so on. We not your kind the march in the So you start off an immersion program, or you could have a bilingual program to integrate them into this into the language, or if they only speak English, you integrate them into your language. And the elders, the elders are so important when you start off your bilingual program. They're the ones that know the language. And I've seen it, I've seen it in the Paw, I've seen it in Blackfoot country, Mohawk country. They have their immersion. Up north, they have their immersion programs. And they're successful. The kids are learning their, their language, and I'm a real fan, or I, that's what I think we have to do now. Not only that, but make, you have to be really strong. The parents, all, most of you are parents here. Go to your councils and whomever runs your, your education, go and tell them that you want immersion programs. An immersion program is the key to, for our kids to learn within the class because our kids are going into class anyway and why are we still teaching them in English? You know, they're going into class, people are still teaching these little grade ones English. You should be teaching them your language. Teach them right up to grade eight if you want. But at least they have to have a basis, a, a foundation for them to know who they are as Anishinaabe people through their language. They're gonna see, they're gonna have English all over the place anyway. On TV, wherever they go for, with their parents, there's English, it's all over the place. And I think uh, my last point is gonna be we, sh we should be like the immigrants that come here. They keep their traditions, they keep their language, and they make sure that their kids know about their old country. And we have to do that. English. Thank you, Ruth. I'm going to get uh, Eunice. Eunice, so I'm going to I think she wants to say something. <laughs> I couldn't see, so I was looking at the screen over there. No, but um, I really would like to speak to that as well. Because over the years, we're losing our language more and more. And Ruth and I have been working on trying to revive our language for many years already. And one the biggest mistake we make is that we pay lip service to it, but we don't practice it. I think we need to start getting serious and teach our children the language through immersion programs. I taught immersion one year to kindergarten and nursery. And you wouldn't believe those kids caught on so fast 
to the syllabics. But one thing that didn't happen was it didn't continue to the next grade. We need to be consistent about teaching our language. It's so important that kids know who they are so they can have that pride and that foundation of being a Cree child, a Dene child, Ojibwe. It's so important, we can't, um, we can't just sit back anymore. We need to have our daycares be total immersion. Before we lose all our elders, the elders now have to be encouraged to be involved. And they will be once given that opportunity. It's so important, you know, my heart just breaks sometimes when I look at these children. And even the older people, they want to learn Cree. They want to learn who they are. That need is there, that desire is there. But we're not giving them that opportunity. We're not giving them the tools to learn the language. You know, when I started school too, just like Don, but I wasn't as big. <laughs> All I knew was Cree. And, you know, I felt so good. I was so proud of who I was before I went to school. But when I did go to school, all that was fading away. It was not important in that building where I was. It, my language was not allowed. It was discouraged. And we need to start letting the children know who they are, the foundation of who they are as our First Nations people. And that we can do that through our language, our culture. We need to start really being serious. And our elders are the ones that are gonna have that, they're gonna have that, they're gonna be able to impart that tradition and knowledge to the future generations and we need to start doing that before it's too late. Igosani Yunus. Okay, elders, is there an elder that really wants to speak, to add on, before we come to an end? Okay. <laughs> you started laughing before I even... <laughs> I, I just... I want to reinforce the language, but I want to also want reinforce the strengthening of the family. If there is anything that, something else that we should work on really hard is to strengthen our family relationships. There was a time when it was a family that raised a child. And, and so I, I, I beg of you as parents, as teachers, please begin the work of strengthening our families. Eh? Thank you, sign it, Don. We have uh, Irvin. Uh, I, I'd like to leave this uh, comment, what Don made. If there's anything that we need to do, part of it is the children that walk through the doors of our schools, a lot of times there's broken attachments. I believe that, that our kids wanna attach themselves to someone. And when that child will attach themselves to someone, it's gonna be someone that they trust. And the family unit is so critical it's a spiritual unit that has been broken. And 
That's why we see isolation of our children sitting in a corner. There's broken attachments and they're looking for someone to attach themselves to. Concerning the, con, in regards to the language, I believe it's in our bloodline, so it's not impossible. I have a brother-in-law that's 54 years old. He's in Red River and he's speaking his language now. So it can be done. He just surprised the whole family. He just one day he told the family that he's going to Red River College, Red River Community College. And he's taken his Cree language. So it's not impossible. We'll, it's in our bloodline. But the attachment is so important. And as Native people, I had the opportunity to listen to Chief Dan George and also meet him. And Chief Dan George said, the white man has something that we can use. And he encouraged us to get a hold of it. And he said, it's education. It's a tool. It's a weapon. And we could survive. We are able, we'll be able to survive in both worlds. And I like that. Thank you. It was Sammy Irvin. That concludes our grandparents panel. We could have gone on and on. Yeah, thank you. Kinanas commit now, Gagan, amigo. It's Sammy.